What is that? I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. We're gonna die out here. We're going this way, and that's it. We gotta come across something. I gave you back the map, I Heather. I gave you the map. I gave you back the map. What they found was a desecration of humanity at the site which trappers have often referred to as Coffin Rock. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yesterday, I asked you what you fucking shut river we you were shut on. Up, I'm gonna fucking stick your head Get this fucking, fucking camera off. Oh, my God, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? Let's make sure you have your backpack and your supplies set. Let's hike through the woods. The creepy woods, that is. I promise, we won't get lost. Just don't lose the map, alright? Once again, I prepare to dive into a horror film. Many of the movies I've spoken about in this particular ongoing series have very interesting and innovative backstories. This one might have the best yet. Imagine you want to make a movie and you decide to do a horror movie documentary style. There's nothing super special about that, right? What if I said the movie pulled off perhaps the greatest successful marketing stunt of all time, pulling the wool over countless amounts of audiences all over? In 1999, The Blair Witch Project attempted just that. Enter directors Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel Merrick, film students at the University of Central Florida who found documentaries on paranormal phenomenon scarier than the traditional horror films themselves the two decided to create a film that combined the styles of both. It's like being a scientist that wants to combine elements to see how alive the end result will be. And we've seen how that ends up, haven't we? The question is, would the project they put together realistically terrify audiences, or would they disbelieve the legend and end up in the darkened corner like Mike? Let's get down to brass tacks. In this Why You Hate video, by the way, I've done several episodes of films that sometimes divides the fans and causes a great discussion for people on both sides of the fence. Check them out in the Why You Hate playlist if you haven't already, or if you need some fun and a good horror discussion, check them out again. It's not going to hurt. I promise. Unless you go into the woods. I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein! And I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time! Also, if you would personally like to help me decide on films for new episodes and much more while supporting this channel, then join our channel membership program by clicking the join button next to the subscribe button. It's a member perk for our movie fanatics level and above. You know you're a movie fanatic. We all are. So as I was saying, I'm going to go over reasons why some fans have issues with The Blair Witch Project including multiple things that I know will be a strong debate in this community for the lovers of this film and the detractors of it. I will also attempt, if at all possible, to show how some issues might not hold as much weight as they seem. Also, I'll touch upon some history and behind the scenes info to give a snapshot of this film's journey. So get your power bars and soft marshmallows, try to figure out the meters on your camera even though you're not in Europe, don't kick the map in the river and stay away from voodoo shit. Here are the reasons why you hate the Blair Witch Project. Number one, marketing. Let's be clear about this. Many people were fooled by the marketing of the Blair Witch Project. I can remember hearing many people personally distraught about the fate of the three leads. It was an actual event that caused fear and tension before anyone even saw one second of the film. When you start to get a hype train running at breakneck speed like that, success is surely going to be there at the destination, right? Probably. But... Here's the thing. There are those people, and it is possibly many of you watching this video right now. you know who you are, who were absolutely frustrated and felt betrayed by the movie and its viral marketing that was as intense and relentless as Heather recording when the shit was getting real. I thought they were really missing. What a sick joke. This movie led me on and so it sucks. Here. We're fine. It is not in the file. It is not. You 
you son of a bitch! And so on and so on and so on. I can understand being frustrated by it if you were truly sympathetic to the imaginary fates of Heather, Josh, and Mike. That's you just being human, which is a good thing by the way. But then again, they were alive and well, so that's good news, right? I mean, that is more important than your hurt feelings. Maybe not. Early on in the marketing campaign, the producers of the film had announced that the film contained real footage and that the characters had actually gone missing. This genius tactic made it one of the first theatrical features to make use of a large-scale viral marketing campaign, which claimed that the three main characters had really gone on a trip to shoot a documentary and were never seen again, save for the footage that they shot being found a year after their disappearances. A website debuted on the internet one year prior to the release in order to set up the premise of the documentary, complete with detailed reports of the search, the recovery of the trio's footage within an old cabin, reactions from their families, and expert opinions. I mean, think about that for a second. The patience and the thought-out plan to basically blast this onto the world started a year before the release. This is some I'm starting my own bedtime ghost story horror myth type shit. I'm not just fucking around here. Letting the story marinate in the minds of people that saw it and that spreads to others and others until it is a forest fire that can't be tamed by anyone. And this is all before you even step into the theater. The three actors were instructed to refrain from making public appearances, which I'm sure was very difficult. Imagine that you have to be careful not to be seen at a gas station, a store, or even out to eat. These three were basically quarantining themselves long before the world had to do it. The myth wasn't debunked until after the movie's premiere, but positive word of mouth had already popularized the movie to the extent that its success completely overshadowed that of the almost simultaneously released big budget horror movie The Haunting from 1999. Which to be fair is a fun and somewhat underrated horror film with a great cast. Predictable at times but fun nonetheless. Shout out to The Haunting which had no clue that it was going to get beat down by the witch in the woods of Maryland. And you blow it! You blew it. This speaks to the power of the imagination and horror. Audiences were hardcore on board with the witch myth and already saw scenes, evil, and fates in their minds played out and preferred that over a regular big release film. Who would have thought? I'll tell you who. The Blair Witch Project filmmaker team, or at least they hoped for it. Which was inspired by the In Search of Television documentaries of the 70s. You know, that's what really inspired us with Blair Witch, you know, and I had a UFO club when I was a kid and, you know, uh, there was just a, this kind of whole, this general neurosis I think people had and also a fascination with wanting to believe in that stuff. And, you know, so that was what we grew up on. That's what scared us as kids, you know. The film was originally planned to include both the story of the missing students as well as the aftermath of their disappearance. The found footage of the trio would be framed by newscasts about the search for them, as well as interviews with family members and experts. Most of this material was cut out during editing for feeling contrived and too scripted, in favor of focusing completely on the story of the three students. However, much of the deleted material could later be used in the viral marketing of the film. Today's horror landscape is, let's just say, interesting, and this was something that means more today than back in 1999. Check it out. Miramax passed on the opportunity to acquire and distribute the movie. The decision was made by executive Jason Blum, who didn't think the movie would be a hit. Blum later became famous for producing another extremely profitable found footage horror film, Paranormal Activity, in 2007. To think that Blumhouse, before it was Blumhouse, didn't believe in the idea is crazy. That being said, perhaps it's fair to say that this film helped shape Michael Myers. What Jason Blum and Blumhouse became. Seeing small budget ideas that garnered big profit would eventually be his calling card. So it's possible that Blumhouse owes some thanks to the Blair Witch Project. I'm just saying. What do you think? It is not in the file. It is not. But wait because this story and its multiple sides is going to go deeper. Number two, iconic or not. 
In today's world, there is strong, and I'm talking incredible Hulk level strong debate on whether The Blair Witch Project is a great or iconic movie. For many years on this channel, especially on countless live streams, we've skimmed the surface of this debate. If you know, you know. It's really good. God damn! What the spicy? Skeet, skeet. Was the movie stupid? Was it a special moment in horror history? Questions that have as many different answers as the noises we heard in them damn woods. Part of it for some may be how much of a horror fan you are and how old you were when you saw the film. We've seen these things play out for multiple episodes of Why You Hate. People that saw films as young horror fans sometimes latch on to it stronger than a seasoned adult who is jaded by all the horror that they've experienced. I don't throw shade to either side because I've been there as an example of both. If you told me that Halloween, Black Christmas from 1974, or Psycho were and are scary and great horror movies, I would absolutely agree because when I was a kid I saw those films and it stoked terror and curiosity in my heart. They gave me movies I enjoyed and latched onto for decades. I'm still not letting go of them. You can't make me. But in the same breath, if you told me that Talk To Me, Terrifier, or Smile were scary and great, I'd give pause because those films don't scare me as they could when I was a kid. So they aren't as powerful in that way and are not as ingrained in me yet. They may be entertaining, possibly great, and become important, but it will take time. So with The Blair Witch Project, I think that is a very important factor. When did you see it? And how old were you? Today, the internet is still fooling people, but we are also able to figure it out quicker. Thanks, AI. Ooh. Full transparency. When it came out, the Guinness Book of World Records listed the Blair Witch Project as the all-time winner in the category of top budget box office ratio, having cost only $60,000 to make and reaping box office receipts of $248 million. It made nearly $11,000 for every dollar spent in filming. It has since been surpassed by Paranormal Activity, which had a budget of $15,000 and made $193 million. The fans of this film will love this as much as the detractors will have a seizure, but it holds a Rotten Tomato score of about 85%. This has the highest score on Rotten Tomatoes of any film that was nominated for the Razzie Award for Worst Picture. Number 3. Actors, Directors Directors Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel Merrick wanted Heather Donahue to have a sort of Captain Ahab quality, obsessively documenting everything. Mike's function in the film is to say the things that the audience is probably thinking, and Josh, for a time, is the team peacemaker. The audition process was quite rigorous because the directors wanted actors with significant improvisational talents. I mean, we just had our friends just funneling in yeah. actors off the street. You know, we gave like, them three minutes each. Yeah, and it just kind of called through all these actors and ended up with, with, uh, with the three leads. Typically, the candidate entering the audition room would immediately be presented with a description like, you've just served 10 years of a 25-year prison sentence. Tell us why you should be due for parole. If the candidate hesitated too long, the audition would be over. Heather Donahue's response was, I don't think you should. Every line in the film was improvised, and nearly all of the events in the film were unknown to the three actors beforehand and they were often on-camera surprises to them all. Each of the three main actors, Heather Donahue, Michael C. Williams, and Joshua Leonard, were forced to sign a release form agreeing to let the producers, quote, mess with your head. The actors were requested to interview the townspeople who often, unbeknownst to the actors, were planted by the directors. As a result, the expressions on the actors' faces were unrehearsed. I will say this right out to be frank, these three actors have to get credit and respect in my book. To do all that they did, especially improvising and being so real, was a tremendous feat. I've seen tons of horror films over the years, and usually the ones that suck have characters that aren't fully realized, 
They didn't feel real. You don't connect with them and you don't care about their fate. Heather, Josh, and Mike truly started to infringe on Rob Zombie turf with the F word and I'm looking at you Halloween and Halloween too. Filthy, dirty hippie. You thought I'd forget, but I didn't. The F word occurs a staggering 154 times in the Blair Witch Project. Good for you guys, you almost made it to the zombie levels. Yay! Interestingly enough, around 45 minutes into the film, when Heather screams, what the fuck is that? She was responding to the sight of art director Ricardo Moreno, who, as a prank, was running alongside them, clad in white stockings with white pantyhose pulled over his head. The cameraman was supposed to pan to the left, where the audience would briefly see a woman wearing a white gown in the distance, but the cameraman forgot to pan to the left and the scene was not reshot. This was supposed to be the one glimpse that you would get of the Blair Witch. I think one aspect that helped their performance maybe as much as anything else was that the three leads believed that the Blair Witch was a real legend during filming. Though, of course, they knew the film was going to be fake. Only after the film's release did they discover that the entire mythology was made up by the film's creators. I can imagine that in their minds there was a bit of fear, even on a subconscious level. The woods can be a creepy place, I've camped quite a few times, and it can be unsettling just to be honest. From Friday the 13th, to The Burning, to Blair Witch, we've seen the woods as a place where evil things can happen. There's no one to run to for help, usually natural obstacles in your way, and even with your friends you are truly alone. The dark of night is as impossibly dark as you could ever imagine, and the question is will that darkness overtake you or spare you? Shit man, if I was in their shoes as an actor, I'd definitely have all of those uneasy thoughts swirling around in my head. Other points to be aware of are, filming only took 8 days, but the editing of it took 8 months. Now in the movie, Heather and Mike share a somewhat antagonistic attitude towards each other, in the commentary, the directors revealed that it was Heather and Joshua who were arguing most of the time and more heatedly. Almost all of the footage of their arguments was taken from the final cut after the filmmakers decided it seemed like both men were ganging up on Heather. One of the drop messages to the actors revealed to Mike that he was the one who was to destroy the map. He improvised on the spot to kick it in the river and thought Heather and Josh had seen him do it. Mike carried this information to himself for much of that day's filming before finding the right moment to reveal it to the other two. During filming the first night scene, Heather Donahue began yelling at the other two actors berating them for not wanting to go out and investigate. It was one of the only times that the directors stepped in to address the actors while in the woods. Notice that in scenes when Josh or Mike are yelling at Heather to put down the camera so that they can start hiking. This is because they are in such a rush to leave, but aren't packing up the tent or gear. They're not packing because they know we're going to come and pack it, says director Daniel Merrick. Number 4. It's not scary. Probably the issue I've heard more often than anything else is that it's not a scary film. People felt that as viewers, they spend 90 minutes in the woods with three people and that's it. I would argue that the downward spiral and atmosphere of the film is the horror of it. Horror has done this countless times over the decades, especially back in the day, allowing the audience to create fear because that will always be more effective. When you start freaking yourself out because now that you're not looking at it, you're sure that the shadow is there now. Right. It's all around us. That is fucking weird. Michael, are you saying you're not coming down? I ain't going down there. Why not? Because I'm not. I don't hear shit. Because you're fucking scared. Because I don't hear anything because anymore. Because you're fucking scared. We heard, you could not deny hearing it. Get your ass out. What's the big deal? Perhaps if it isn't scary at all, it's because you just didn't care about the characters as they go through their trials in the woods. That's fair enough. Sometimes characters just don't pop for some. I think mindset and expectations play a role in that. What do you want out of the movie you're watching? What do you expect? Should you expect anything? Did you want 1,000 witches to descend upon the characters with 100 gallons of blood and infinite death? You're goddamn right. If you go into a movie, no matter what genre, and already decide what you want, 
then you will probably always deal with disappointment. Although the concept of a movie consisting of people's recovered video recordings is not new, with Cannibal Holocaust in 1980 as a notable early example, the Blair Witch Project managed to reinvigorate the found footage style of filming for several decades to come, inspiring other horror movies like Paranormal Activity 2007, Wreck 2007, and The Last Exorcism in 2010 but also non-horror productions such as Cloverfield in 2008, Chronicle in 2012, and Project X in 2012. This showed that at the end of the day, enough people reacted strongly in the positive that the studios wanted to emulate the success of the Blair Witch, right or wrong. An early idea for the ending would have revealed that either the fisherman or his son-in-law would have been pranking the main characters all along, but this was rejected for sounding too similar to Scooby-Doo. I can't lie, this type of ending would have destroyed everything they worked hard to create, in my opinion. And you blew it! You blew it! I'm very glad they realized that in creating a myth that is supposed to be serious, you just can't start cracking jokes against it for the ending and expect audiences to stay on board. Despite being given walkie-talkies with which to contact the production crew during emergencies and a GPS device to keep them on course, the actors actually got lost three times during the filming. Talk about fantasy meeting reality. Shortly after the 50-minute mark, when Josh, Mike, and Heather are exasperated that they've walked all day and wound up where they started, their reaction was real. This is actually what had happened. The sounds of Josh hollering in the film's last scene, though, had been taped beforehand and were broadcast on speakers hidden in the woods from Heather and Mike. In an interview with Fangoria magazine, Heather Donahue claimed that she was so horrified by the final scene, she was crying and breathing heavily long after it was shot. Michael C. Williams said that the sounds of children were what frightened him the most during filming. All of this begs the question to be asked to you. Is this movie scary or creepy? Is it either? Maybe you already have the answer, maybe not. Let's continue to trek through the woods and see where it leads us. Number 5. Where's the Witch? The other problem that plagued this movie. Where's the fucking Blair Witch? We don't ever see her. Never. Although again, they had planned to quickly show a shot of her which never was captured. No glimpse. No witchy spells, no coven, no broomstick, no reveal, no wizard behind the curtain, no trust, liar. To be frank here, and I can't lie, I think if they had made the shot happen, it would have elevated the movie for many people. For me, yeah, that would have been cool, just a sneak peek definitely would have creeped me out. But here's the other thing, not seeing her was creepy in its own way. My mind saw shit that wasn't there. Maybe it's a situation of less is more. Does that work for you in movies? Uh, huh? The sequel sure tried to fix this problem, and damn, we saw multiple people that were, quote, the witch. Of course, that film got flack, and still gets flack, but that's a story for another day. For being a regular structured film, and for being much more cookie cutter. Damn, this franchise can't win either way. Show me the witch. Don't show me the witch. Which way of the witch is the way? Here's a thing to think about though. What if we did see the witch? Did we want to see the witch attack them as they were running in the dark? Did we want to hear her cackle and distort her body as we ooh and ah? Films that go the simple route on witches tend to fare pretty well now come to think of it. The movie The Witch big time comes to my mind. That one shot that we clearly see the witch while she is hypnotizing and bewitching young Caleb before kissing him is thrilling yet terrifying. Perhaps that could have been done in Blair Witch to Josh before his disappearance. Maybe after the encounter, he forgets about it. And then that night, boom, he's gone. Number six, finale. It always comes down to sticking the landing. The good news for this film is that it hits fifth gear and continues for the last 30 minutes. 
and the stark reality of the characters starts to really set in. You feel bad for the situation they are in and constantly wonder how the fuck did it get to this point. And you blew it! You blew it! I mean, you are literally lost in the woods and there is no one that is coming to save you. You've been attacked at night, hearing strange voices, low on food, morale, and hope. I'm not gonna lie, this is some pretty horrific shit to be dealing with and the thing is, is that people really go through this in the real world. After Josh's disappearance, the spiral is faster and more desperate. Heather's apology entry, which is one of the most iconic moments in the film, lays out all the emotion and regret she has. Very powerful and if nothing else, unique in horror. When they find the house at the end, there is tension, curiosity, half hope, and fucking fear. It doesn't go the way you'd expect. We still don't see the witch, but what we do experience is those damn voices, noises, desperation, and then the ending. Separated, scared, and trying to find Josh as they hear him crying out. Mike goes after it downstairs as Heather lags behind. When she finds Mike, he's in that corner. Then darkness, nothing. The tape is over, mic drop. A powerful ending that many find scary. Others may shake their heads and disappoint it because they didn't get the answers that they wanted, the answers that they needed. At the end of the day, the Blair Witch Project made horror fans lost in their experience more than Heather, Josh, and Mike were in the woods and we as fans must deal with it in our own way. You have to ask yourself, was the Blair Witch Project a good movie? Is it iconic? Is it a horror game changer? Or did it fail to impress like the Unseen Witch? That is a question only you can answer. As always, this video is not here to make you love the Blair Witch Project or to hate it. It's simply a discussion to highlight the history and aspects of it, good or bad, with you, the viewer. So what do you think? Are you a fan of the Blair Witch Project? If so, tell us why. If not, Let's discuss why you hate the Blair Witch Project. If you haven't hit the like button for more content, please do. If you're not subscribed to the Nightwatch Zone, this is the time to do it. Do it and become part of this fantastic movie community where you'll never love and talk about movies the same. If you like this video, check out my other Why You Hate videos, live streams, and other content here, and I'll see you there. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this, you are the Nightwatch. Peace.